think you're a signal from there. Do you think that you're can it still connected upstairs with the computer you borrowed? Or do you think it's connected through your your um I don't know. I don't know which one I, I've never put uh uh T P link on the, the computers to check the thing. You know, I always use my phone with the app. Hey, is there a Windows app for it? I didn't so think there you, was. I don't know. Yeah, Judy, go ahead. I know I don't have so it. So have you re have you rebooted your phone? I've turned it off and turned it on. No, I didn't. That's not rebooted. Okay, so well, how do you reboot it? You have it? to do a, I don't know what kind of phone you have, Scott. Okay. Well, I mean, it does depend well, on what... A, what kind of phone you have? But, Motorola. Yeah, if you hold the power button, it should give you a screen with a with a swiper or a button to either shut down or reboot. Yeah, I've I've done that. You've done that. Restart. Okay. Yeah, the mm -hmm. restart that should do it, and it, it's significant that you can't get on with two computers, and both of them are spending their times downstairs, but you can't get on upstairs either, huh? Uh, not with my phone, no. Not with your phone, and you I haven't have brought the computer upstairs. No, no, I haven't. You know, at this point, I mean, other than I don't want you to get disconnected during our meeting because we're about to officially start it. Um, yeah. After we're done, I would unplug your extender and see if that borrowed computer continues to run downstairs. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah. If it if it does. I, if it does then it might be that extender that's the issue because uh, the equipment you already have downstairs is probably preferring that that extender. Yeah. Of course, they're supposed to float. This mesh is supposed to float from one device to the other device. Right. Yeah. Well, I'd be pulling my hair out, but it's too short. <laughs> I could pull my beard out, I guess. Well, how's everybody doing this morning? Just to let you know, I have hit the streaming button because I forgot to hit it last week. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> so we had an interesting thing here in San Carlos. I guess we had a, a blackout that knocked out one of uh, the tower routers per Juan. And it went all over the, as far as Guadalajara is what he told me, but I only read as far as Chihuahua, but. Well, I'm not, so we have... I'm not certain about all that, but I could tell you the experience we had out here in the Ranchitos. And I was hoping to ask you guys about your experience. The Ranchitos. What's that? <laughs> I do live in the Ranchitos. I right. live in Loma del Mar. That's right. in the Ranchitos. So yesterday, oh, and let me just say, this is the San Carlos Computer Club. I'm Scott Stimson from International Computer Solutions, and I'm here to help. If you guys need help, I can get into your computer remotely, and I can do things for you. If you're looking for help, you can send an email to remote at internationalcs.net. That's my official plug for today's meeting. And I wanted to tell you guys, about what happened to us in the Ranchitos yesterday while I'm doing work and my kids are at school. We had three power fluctuations. And they were so subtle, you wouldn't have recognized them. The only reason I was aware of the first two was because my battery backup in the house started beeping. But all the equipment in my office stayed on, my kids stayed online, we all stayed online. But I noticed that my battery started beeping. I'm like, hey, that's weird. Because everything's up and the battery only beeps when there's no electricity. And then it probably about less than 10 minutes later, it beeps again. Like, still weird. I wonder what's going on. But I look over, I'm online, my kids are doing their stuff. I mean, it hasn't even drop the power. It's not like things are rebooting and getting started again. It's just like something fluctuated. And then and the was, it, was it like between 1030 and 11 in the morning? Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah I'm sure I'm sure it's the same thing because mm -hmm. on the third one, I lost the computers in my in my um, house that are on that battery. I hear the battery come on 
And this time, both the Macintoshes crash because that battery's old and doesn't have enough electricity to keep them running. So they crash, and I hear them on the restart, and I look over, and right in front of me, you guys don't know this, but as I'm peering off at you guys, I can also look at all these lights on my network equipment. And the network equipment is telling me that the Telmix DSL is rebooting, and I can see the light for Quan's connection, and I can see that it's not behaving correctly, and so we've lost both internet connections. The monitor that I'm looking at your guys' pretty faces on, it went black and then started back up at the same time I heard my computers in the house reboot. And so this wow. time I know there's been a there's been a surge or a power out. And the kids are getting a little nervous because one of them's got class starting in 10 minutes. And I'm watching the DSL modem and I'm texting Juan to let him know because his link was the first to be back up, but I had no internet. And exactly. I could I could reach all the way out to his main connection. I could I could make that connection all the way there using a ping command, but I couldn't go outside of his connection. And right, I want a link, uh why must link something, uh, and then it would go cannot connect. And so I couldn't even get to him on WhatsApp. It was WhatsApp was down as well. Well, well, actually, your Wi-Fi was down. You probably, if you could have gotten over to the cell network, you could have gotten a hold of him. No, I no, I could not. Well, because you my could get WhatsApp goes off my cell network. Okay, well, I was able to get a hold of him. I used Facebook Messenger. All I, I, used, all, all, I all I did was switch over to cell data. I just turned off my Wi-Fi and used Telcel. The but the DSL me. from Telmex wasn't coming back up. And anybody that's had a DSL connection knows that like you reboot the DSL and you wait for a DSL light and it flashes and flashes and flashes, synchronizing. And then finally it's solid. And then an internet light will turn on and now you can use the internet. And in this case, there was no DSL light. It was just completely dead. Like Telmex was shut off on the other end. Juan was shut off on the other end. Telmex was shut off on the other end. And that went on for a good five minutes, maybe 10 minutes. And then Telmex was back up. I was almost ready to report Telmex and they were back up. And so my kids were doing their stuff at less than 10 me megabits a second. And then probably in less than an hour, Juan's connection came back up. Right. He had to do something uh, with a modem on his tower, I think is what he told me. Oh, okay. Because my my modem from Juan, went, it had an orange light rather than two greens. And uh, so when I told him that, he said, give me five or ten minutes. I'm working on it. So then he called, he actually called me and asked me to go down and check it. Go down and what? And Everybody's frozen my modem because it's then it was up oh okay yeah he he sent me a message as well going everything should be up now and i i, I hadn't had a chance to tell him i know i got it. <laughs> it's working it's awesome i wish i had more yeah. upload speed i don't know what's happened with his system he hasn't given me a straight answer geez mine went to 75 <clears throat> download and 75 upload and he said you're one lucky person yeah <laughs> No, and I'm, I, said, I'm I, don't I, I get the, I was getting those kinds of speeds when I first hooked up with him and, and now I can get over 90 at times, but uploads are always, they're always really slow. They're, they're always like 14 at most. No, mine are better than that. Usually hold on. I'll check. Well, hopefully we don't use up all the best well, bandwidth hopefully. for our conversation. Hopefully my uh, uh, brownout uh, resistant power bar worked for me. Uh, you know, because uh, if the voltage drops below 90, it shuts off. And when it comes back up, because I have uh, a, a freezer and a refrigerator attached to it. Right. So it's, I'm, so I'm did you have a refrigerator that you could tell was suffering or air conditioner that was suffering? 
No, in fact, it was so unnotable that the surge had happened that I'm I'm thinking maybe it was a spike in voltage, not a drop in voltage. Oh yeah, okay. Because everything just kept purring through the first two. The first two. And you didn't smell any brown, huh? No, nothing, 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 nothing. Um, I'm coming through on somebody's speakers. I'm sorry to say. So I just checked, and mine is 35 download, 71 upload. Ah, <laughs> that's that leaves you with mixed feelings. <laughs> Makes me happy. I don't I'd care. be really happy to have that upload speed, but I am getting faster than that download. <laughs> <laughs> now that's different, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, welcome everybody. I see Dave showed up. Sid's here. Kathleen's joined us. Good morning, everybody. We were just talking about the voltage surge that hit us yesterday morning here in San Carlos that seemed to affect people across the, the city. It was across the northern part of Mexico. I read on uh, Mexico News Daily that their natural gas uh, supply from Texas had had something that happened to that with the cold snap. So it caused a lot of the power grid to go down. What happened in Texas was that they had rolling, <clears throat> rolling brownouts or rolling shutdowns, and therefore that uh, affected the compressors that push gas down to Sonora. Uh, a lot of it was caused by the fact that uh, Texas has had 25% of its power coming from windmills in West Texas now, and those windmills froze up, so they didn't have enough power. Wow. Wow. Unforeseen. <laughs> Un who knew? <laughs> they are you, are, Chester, I hadn't heard that at all, so what, let me just reiterate. What you're saying is that because of the Texas power problems, they weren't able to pressurize gas lines that Sonora, uh, um, what's the word I, I'm looking at, depend on. Yes, that's yes. correct. Well, I don't know about the pressure part, but it was on Mexico News Daily that they were not getting enough. And that makes a lot of sense, Chester, that that's why it wasn't pushing gas down. Wow. I mean, that, that just brings all kinds of questions to mind. I mean, including, don't we have national gas? You would think a federal electric company would be using national gas. They rely a lot, especially up here in the northern part, on, on U.S. natural gas. Yeah, I guess I guess so. Well, yeah, when I say natural gas, I mean national gas. Is that what I said? I thought I said national. <laughs> said national, but. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, read the article on Mexico News Daily. Hey, can you send me the link? Sure. Have you got it? You, I'll find it. That would be awesome. I'd love to read it. Okay. Because really, here in the Ranchitos, it was just a sputter of our day. But then you look at Texas, and I couldn't imagine. Can you imagine being in Texas, dealing with snow and temperatures like you're in Canada? <laughs> well, my Canadian cousin is in Katy, Texas, and um, yesterday she had power outages, but the day before that, uh, before the snow hit, when it was just cold, she's waiting in the grocery pickup lane for her online delivery of the, the groceries, and her car battery quit. <laughs> so she, oh, she, no. had, she had to call AAA to get her car boosted, and she said, this is Canadian activity, not Texas, you know. And uh, anyways, I think I've got her making a snow angel today. So. <laughs> well, does she and she has power now? Yeah. Well, it was off and on all day yesterday. I think they were three hours without it during the day, and then last night I saw it at about seven o'clock. She said, "Power's gone again." So. It it you know stuff like this also makes me think about electric vehicles too. I, like here's a freak storm no one was expecting, bro takes out the the power grid and we're in the midst of this transition over to alternate power sources. 
Well, the, I was interested when you said about the windmills, Chester. I, I thought, oh no, <laughs> you know, like that's, yeah. Well, I, was, I, was surprised, I was surprised to learn that 25% uh, of Texas power supply is from windmills. <clears throat> I was too, <laughs> especially because, you know, our pipelines and everything and we're the, the pipeline capital of Canada. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, we've been talking about replacing it with all kinds of windmills and stuff. So uh, that's uh, interesting that they froze. <laughs> Well, it's similar to what you have with an airplane wing when you get uh, icing conditions. Well, it imbalances the blades on the windmills. And uh, then they also had a problem with no wind. So they, they just didn't have enough uh, sta standby power to supply the state. And so they have rolling blackouts. And with another storm coming through this week, they'll probably have it again. Well, wow, that's a good argument for fortifying electrical systems, maybe staying with traditional and alternative at the same time, just like a backup generator for a hospital when their electricity goes out. Maybe we need a backup generator for our states. Well, that gets expensive. And, and what this also shows is the vulnerability of relying on windmill, windmills and solar uh, power. I was just thinking the same thing. I, it'll be interesting because this storm will force them to analyze this. It'll be interesting to see how long it takes for the windmills that were damaged to get back online and how much it'll cost to bring them back online in comparison to just regular line operations, which is what you would have going to a traditional power power supply. I, I doubt they were damaged. They were probably just shut down. Probably the just shut down. Well, that's the big thing with like wind and solar right now. And uh, well, Tesla's building battery farms in Australia for the same reason. It's you have to store that energy. So when the system is not producing as much as it needs, you have something stored to use. It's like, Scott, you and me discussing uh, having a battery bank to back up your solar for during the day or during the night. It's the same principle. Sure, yeah, absolutely. On the news yesterday, and someone put out a statistic. I can't remember the specifics, but uh, it was a horrendous amount of battery storage would be required to uh, to supplement this problem. I, I understand that uh, the battery capacity that would be of, that could be made available would do take care of 14 seconds of the needed power. <laughs> it's just the vulnerability of wind solar. Sure. Sure. No, it's uh wow. Wow, and well, and to have it fluctuate electricity here. I mean like there's I there's no snow here in case you're curious. <laughs> we, we, we're not suffering any storm here. <laughs> Well, in California, they have uh, rolling blackouts because of the too much wind when it, it jeopardizes the power lines. Uh, PG and E turns them off. Yeah, I thought because they, they I, had so much trouble with fires. I was going to say, Paul, I thought rolling blackouts in California were, at this point were just a tradition. Well, the uh, <laughs> afternoon, the, the evening uh, uh, air conditioner wave you know that uh, caused a lot of problems but but uh, here's a real head scratcher for you the a friend of mine sent me a picture of a, a electric car charging station powered by a diesel generator yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful I a question about electric cars now that we're kind of talking about it so if i had an electric car and I know where there's a charging station in Wymus, but if I get stuck at the border for a long wait to get across, what do you do if you have an electric car? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I wonder, do you, does anybody know an owner of an electric vehicle that's been going across the border? I can't think of anybody. Hybrids. 
yeah, yeah. definitely you no know, buses and that kind of stuff but not an electric this this whole conversation has made me switch the idea that a hybrid would be a better great all i always thought the best electric car electric vehicle for san carlos would be a uh a golf cart, an electric golf cart, with one of those little Honda electric generators, right? And you could plug it into your house to charge it, or you could have a solar panel that's charging it. But when you get out in the real world and you need to charge it, you just crank the generator on and plug it in. <laughs> Actually, it's it, it's interesting we're talking about this. One of the topics I brought today, I mean, I don't want to dive into it too early. But one of the topics I brought was this idea that farmers are having to hack their their tractors. I, I I don't know if you guys have seen any of this stuff. It's been going on for a while. John Deere has done stuff like put uh, copyright protection on their software and built processes into their devices so that you can't fix it yourself, which goes completely against farming the natural idea of farming for hundreds of years that you are, it's you and your earth and your tools and you're doing it. And here are these tractors, sophisticated tractors you could have purchased that may sit offline for hours at a time because you're not able to take a wrench to it. There's a, a, an article well, that I'll Scott, there. I'm, go ahead, Bill. Can you yeah, hear me? Well, oh. uh, the, the thing is that those, those things are are so complicated you don't take wrenches to them you, you know you pull up to it with a truck and a bank of of data processors and and that just to diagnose it well Let alone and then the fixing is just pull a, well, pull a chipboard and throw another one in it's one guy in a pickup truck with a laptop you got to call him from three counties over that's what it is i got a, i've got family members that deal with this on a regular basis they're farmers in ohio and uh it's got to the point my cousin tom has gone back and completely rebuilt a 1972 gleaner combine and that's what he uses to run run on his farm for uh harvesting he he took his john, brand new john deere back two years ago and said you guys can keep it yeah, in this article I was reading, they actually talked about how farmers are starting to look for old equipment. And it made me think about how, like, I find a refrigerator that's uh, 20 years old, uh, probably a better investment than buying a brand new one right now because of the whole smart appliance thing that's going on. These farmers, that Sid's talking about, you're, you're either doing it legitimately – or more likely, you're getting into the pirate networks. You're you're going. You're getting pirate. In fact, let me read this quote from this article. I thought this was great. The pirated tractor firmware still goes through the black market of paid invite-only forums. Much of it comes from Eastern Europe, and the sites themselves can be hard to access. Once there, farmers can find electronic data link servers diagnostics programs, license key generators, speed limit modifiers, and even reverse engineered cables that they need to keep their, their equipment running. Now, I think about the, the nature of farmers in the first place and, and going to your internet black market site, I think would be a more likely thing than calling for the $100 or $200 40 hour visit from the town next over. Farmers have become some of the, because of this, farmers have become some of the loudest voices in the fight for the right to repair that would guarantee access to the tools and diagnostic systems necessary to fix their own stuff. And right now, apparently, there's 20 states that have right to repair bills going on. I didn't mean for this to turn political, but this is a great thing to be thinking about <laughs> because... The farmers are what what are going to drive this idea that we can repair anything. The farmers are going to get the legislation down. And this brings to me, this is kind of the reason I bring it up now instead of saving it as a topic later. 
the <laughs> the idea of passive smart. And I think that we as tech tech enthusiasts have to promote this idea of passive smart devices. And these are devices that have proved themselves to our, us and our culture over hundreds of years as being solid sound technology. Things like stoves and refrigerators, right? things like tractors and cars, where they're not dependent on the smart aspect of it because they ran for a hundred years without being smart. I think that we should be supporting legislation, and this is me, but I would, I would encourage you to feel the same way, that the devices that are being created in the future cannot rely on that smart. They have to rely on being that device. I mean, I can't imagine owning a hammer that would need a fingerprint sensor to use it. Right? I can't imagine a hammer that would need a firmware update for you to continue to drive nails with it. And I feel the same way about your home stove and your home refrigerator and the car you drive. In my vision of the future, if I want a smart device, it's a box that's plugged into that appliance. And when that box is no longer doing its job or it fails or has a problem, I can take it out of the car and the car still drives because that's what cars have been doing for a hundred years. You can take it out of the fridge and the fridge still keeps food cold because that's what they've done for a hundred years. Well, we've been dealing with that in the construction world in the last six, seven years. Um, an example is like the emissions control device is on, uh, on a lot of heavy equipment like big rock trucks and excavators and stuff like that. It recycles the computer on the equipment sets a gate that recycles the exhaust to burn off stuff. And the software on that is notoriously horrible. So you're sitting out on a job and your lead piece of equipment's an excavator, and all of a sudden it's not going to work. Everything's perfectly fine. There's no mechanical problem, but just a glitch in software brings the entire project to a halt. Oh, that's we do it all the time. I just had it happen on the project last year. Brand new Hitachi excavator, and it died on them like three times, and it was all just software. This is the stuff that just blows my mind. Chester, were you going to add something? I'm sorry. I wanted to add a comment that I reminded of the good old days uh, when I worked at my dad's service station, and we tuned up a car with new spark plugs every 10,000 miles and every thousand miles we greased and changed the oil. And if the car lasted 30,000 miles, we were lucky. Today you buy a car, you never touch it. You change your oil, maybe the tires and the battery and 120,000, 140,000 miles later, you might have a repair. So there's good and there's bad. And, and frankly, I'll take, the modern equipment versus what we used to have in the old days, the good old days. Well, I guess I don't feel like you have to um, compromise between passive and I mean, passive smart and modern equipment. I just think you need a different design philosophy where you, your priorities are set in a way that the function, I, for me, it really is function should be first. That base function, again, I'm talking about devices that are 100 years old. A car should be able to drive you from one place to another, regardless of whether the computer works. And it, I only imagine it's getting worse with the electric cars. Your infotainment center is the nervous system of your car. Could you imagine not being able to start it because you haven't gotten the latest firmware update? Just seems like a goofy way to go forward with with technology same with the Michael. fridge we threw away at the bed and breakfast a wall fridge because the motherboard that controlled it was no longer being produced so it was scrapped a thousand plus dollar refrigerator was scrapped because we couldn't get a computer mother to work and even though the motherboard was burned out it wouldn't keep things cold like I'm getting too excited over here. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> I I kind of feel like if you own a refrigerator, regardless of how efficient it could be, if it stops working, please keep food cold until I can get it fixed. It's what yeah, what I always get frustrated with is the disposability of, of things. Um, how often do we have to buy new computers? Why can't we just fix the old ones? You know, why why do we have to buy new things all the time? Why can't we fix the old? And that's what we appreciate about Mexico. They fix things. They don't just scrap them. <laughs> you know, so I, I like that. I I'd rather see something fixed than thrown away. Yeah, sure. I I would think that has more to do with their lower income economy. There is value in fixing things because people will do those jobs. And we've made things so expensive to live in, in, I guess, first world nations that there's no value in fixing those things anymore. I, I, if your refrigerator I stops, <clears throat> if your refrigerator stops, put a block of ice in there, then you have an ice box. <laughs> We're going way old when I was school. A kid, my, <laughs> when I was a kid, my job was to empty the pan of water underneath the ice box. Yeah, mine too. My job was to go to the ice house and bring the ice back in my little red flyer. <laughs> well, I, was, I was in San Francisco. They delivered ice. We were the last house on the block to put out the ice sign. Mm. Because you're using an, an ice box so long? Yeah, we had an icebox, and then finally my grandmother gave us her old refrigerator that, you know, had a condenser on the top. It looked like a spaceship on the top. Right. Hey, I bet that refrigerator still works, huh? It probably would. <laughs> sister has one of those in, up in her apartment. That she, That's where she stores all of her stuff that doesn't fit downstairs, and that refrigerator works, and it's worked since... I don't know. It's always been up there. It was the maid's quarters years and years and years ago, like in when the house was built in 1905. The, I think that, that kind of stuff is a true testimony to what I'm saying is that the when we stopped building appliances to last and built them for profit, which meant you were going to buy new ones every 10 years, that's when it started being okay for a motherboard to blow out and have to go buy another refrigerator. Whereas 100 years ago, a refrigerator kept things cold. It's just what it did long before we had icy chips, long before we had software. Seems to me if we had a revolution in, in the way we design consumer products, then these smarts could be added with just a, just a cartridge, something of that nature. And we would be buying new cartridges. It's like you want to you want to save a little bit more electricity on your sharp refrigerator. We'll buy the latest cartridge, and we've been able to eke out another ten watts a month savings. So uh, another thing about those cars that you were talking about that were pretty, you know, un, it would go for thirty thousand, maybe even a hundred thousand, at the same time as those uh, un, unsmart cars were being made. There was also uh, Volvos and Volkswagens and so on that were going three times as far. They were, because the nugget of the thing was good, and and I, so I agree with uh, with Scott there that by by making them smart but still having the nugget underneath would probably uh, be a way of doing it. I remember in a town I lived in, we were overcome by a, a, a regional district, so our water came from from uh, the region rather than from our town, and but we had a very good well. And uh, and we thought, oh, we at least have backup. But it ended up that after a while, people wouldn't pay into keeping the well going because it costs a lot of money just to keep that well going. I thought about that with your uh, losing electricity in in uh, in Texas. You know, to, to keep that other system going just at marking time is an expensive thing to do. Well, I, two times, two I Jim, you know, you th what I think of when you did I lose it? I just lost it. I just lost my point. I, all, all I was doing was taking Jim off the you? screen and it distracted my brain enough that I don't know what my point was. Well, <laughs> so, 
Those old people, yeah, those old well, people who were built built a long time ago have an excuse. Your your motherboard isn't working right today. <laughs> hey, I'm gonna be 51 this year, so I'm not young. Oh yes, you are. <laughs> Everything is relative. I can tell when it comes to moving furniture in the bed and breakfast that time is catching up with Scott. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he does a lot of work, no doubt about it, but boy, he goes home at night kind of bent. <laughs> that is funny. The last few years that we've had to arrange a furniture, I've had to have more help, and I and we've had to take breaks to be careful with my back. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wise thing to do. Yeah. Water boy, I wish I could get back to where I was, but I've lost it now. We, we, we're talking about we're talking about the cars that had the uh, the, the uh, module that you could you could change the computers in them. Yeah. And another thing about, about keeping a, a, a system uh, running, even though you're not using it, but only as a backup, because it costs a lot to ooh, maintain. Oh, I got it! Thank you, Jim. <laughs> I got it. Well, all I wanted to add on to that was when you look at where we are with modern technology and our concerns for solar flares. I, the, we, we've always had the same risk of solar flares, but we've never had such a fragile infrastructure to be affected by them. And we've been concerned about flares ever since the turn of the century when fires were started and telegraph lines where were down and caught fire. But it really didn't have the kind of like monumental shift in our culture, like solar flares like that could cause us right now. But there's there's a good argument for a lot of, or of our um, our um, instability in IT and network network infrastructure is caused by solar flares. And the reason that these things are so susceptible is because we don't build uh, to fortify against that kind of stuff because it's so much more expensive. And so we build the cheapest product that we can sell to make money, and it isn't fortified against solar flares, and so it is susceptible to interference and possibly being burned up. And now we're finding ourselves in this 100-year cycle of solar flares being the strongest they've ever been. It's, I guess it's just more to the pile of We've been going along this this methodology of product development, which has been driven mostly by capitalism, and there's this foresight that we're not putting into it. I I think that was the end of my point. Yeah. <laughs> Either that or it's built in obsolescence and we're putting a lot of forethought into it. Well, there you go. It is actually, right? It's it's but when I say we're not putting a lot of forethought into it, it's us. Us as a group, as a community, yeah. Yeah. not not shaping where we want to see the future go. And so yeah. we're allowing things like planned obsolescence to be built in because that's mm -hmm. the best way to make money off of those products. Mm -hmm. And then we listen to the propaganda, I mean the advertising. Yeah. Look, a lot of it though has to do <clears throat> with technological improvements and just look at the computer industry and what has transpired in our lifetime with respect to computers from the first um, 8088 that uh, you had to use DOS to move around in it. Uh, but, you know, obsolescence has a lot to do with why you don't run, still run a 1920 automobile, you know. Certainly. Certainly. But there are some of those vehicles that that have lasted a very long time. Oh, here in Vancouver Island, we got uh, Rolls and Mercedes and things like that that are still going. It's still going. <laughs> wow, James is living the high life out there. <laughs> Well, I don't have them. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, I'm like, are you <laughs> describing your garage? You don't sound very Canadian to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I don't have any of those. But they're around. You see them around. And, and in California, you see some too, you know. But... Some of those older, older vehicles. Mm -hmm. Well, um, 
Let's see. I wanted to follow up. If you guys are ready for a subject change, that was all impromptu talk. <clears throat> but it uh, feels like we're kind of at an impasse. And I got one thing that I wanted to follow up from last week. In the midst, I was listening to our, our audio. And in the midst of a conversation about eye devices, I started talking about Amazon devices. And uh, that might have been confusing because it was confusing when I listened to it later. <laughs> I was trying to make a point about music plans, and I never did make the point, and it was in the wrong place in our discussion. So I just wanted to go back to that and say the conclusion of what I was trying to get at is if you want music on an Amazon smart speaker in different rooms, you must use different accounts, and you have to buy the family unlimited music plan. You've got the unlimited plan that gives you a whole library of music. You've got family plans that allow you to share your Amazon devices amongst a number of accounts. And then you also have the unlimited music family plan that allows you to use up to six devices at the same time for different content. And I did not make that clear because I was having trouble making it clear and if it was really confusing, it wasn't the right point to be making at the time. But I'll put a link to Amazon's offer so you can see what I'm talking about. <laughs> any so, other if people have any follow-ups from our last meeting? Just on that one. Okay. So the Amazon account, like Amazon Prime. Yes. Is the account. Okay. And you can have it so that you can have one device or you can have multi devices underneath your Amazon Prime music plan. Yes. And then if you're saying that if you buy the deluxe one, you can also add another Amazon account and they can share that deluxe Amazon Prime music plan. Yes. But for you to be able to play two different sets of music on two different devices, then you have to use, I'm sorry, I've mixed them up again. The, the deluxe that you're talking, the deluxe words that you used is actually referring to Amazon Unlimited Family. So there's Amazon Unlimited Music right. and there's Amazon Unlimited Music Family Plan. And it's the Amazon Unlimited music family plan that allows you to have more than one smart speaker playing different music at the same time. And there isn't a way to do that. So I know why this keeps getting back in my crawl is that maybe I don't want the unlimited music. Maybe I'm happy with the 8 million songs instead of the 80 million songs. And I don't want to pay that monthly fee for access. I'm happy with the Prime. However, if I want to have different songs in different rooms, if my kids want to listen to their music in their room, and I want to listen to my music in my room, then I must have this Amazon Unlimited Music Family Plan, which is an additional $6. <laughs> So there's there's a price for just um, Amazon Music. The yeah, Amazon Unlimited Music has a price. Amazon that, Music comes to you with Prime. Okay, Amazon Music comes with Prime, but it can only be played on one device. That's right. No, it can be played on all the devices or on one device, but it's always the same content. So you could you could sprinkle smart speakers throughout your house and have them all playing Jingle Bell at the same time. But when you buy that unlimited music plan, can't isn't there two levels? And that's One. what that, that's what I'm saying. There's two levels. The first one gives you access to the library, 80 million songs or more right. at this point. The second level allows you to play different songs on different devices, up to six devices. And that's the family one. That's the family one, yeah. 
but do each of the devices have to have their own Amazon Prime? No. No. Up to six accounts. 70 million songs. It's getting smaller. I'm looking now. 70 million songs up to six accounts. Six accounts. Yeah. Six accounts. So you, have have, you have to have another Amazon Prime account. I. Damn it. I thought I knew all this. <laughs> That's why I get confused too, because I know we have the Amazon Prime unlimited music, but we seem to purchase one that you can only play on one device. That's so we can have the Amazon, the whole library available in the living room. And then in the other room, we can just have the non. Because of uh, two different accounts. Oh, wow. This is an interesting nope. way to think about it. One account, one account. One account. We only have one Amazon account. But, and only one at a time. And only one at a time. So you can yeah, you can, here Scott, here's here's an example. I can sure. set up a playlist that'll play in the living room that will play any song that's on the seventy million whatever. If I'm not playing anything on that one, I go to the bedroom and play the same playlist. There are certain songs that are missing, but it will play over there on that playlist. But they can't play at the same time. You'll get a message saying uh, you're you're using another another device. Bill, the way I understand it, and I wouldn't be surprised if technically something's going wrong. But the way I understand it is, you should be able to play because you're an unlimited customer. You should be able to make your playlist out of all of those seventy songs. No, but we we have a restricted one. Uh, we pay three dollars and ninety nine cents. So that we can play the whole list through the living room. If, yeah. we're, if we want to play, pay eight dollars, then we could play the whole list through any one of the devices at one time. So we are we're on that reduced. It, it's you get the whole but library, eight. but it's only on one device and one device only. The way, gosh, now the way I understood that was that you would have you'd be able to play that whole list on any one of your devices at a time. Oh. No, That's not how it works. We we can play any song in the living room here on that device. On that device, we designated yeah. that one. We designated that one. They're on the Canadian and, plan. Yeah, could be. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder if you do have a different offering because because the way I understand Maybe. what I've read is that you should be able to if you've got the unlimited the the music unlimited by itself. You should be able to have access to the entire library of songs, one at a time. No, on on one device at any given time. Yeah, or and that's the that's the eight dollar plan. Okay. The four dollar plan is we designated a device, and that's the only one you can play. The unlimited two. The other one is just okay. Amazon Prime Music. I guess I haven't music. run into that plan at all. Well, then look it up. <laughs> but. <laughs> But still, okay. So if you were on the eight nine, you're talking about the eight ninety nine plan. I think it's like eight ninety nine. Sorry, eight ninety nine. I, I think of it as the nine dollar plan. Nine dollar plan and the four dollar plan. So the way I understand the nine dollar plan is that you could you could listen to any of those songs from their library on any device in the house. One, one at a time. One at a time, or every device. You, you'd have to put your devices in a group, but you could say play everywhere. And it'll play that playlist everywhere. But oh, you're, maybe. yeah, yeah, that, that's that's the way it should work. At least with okay, the nine dollar plan. <laughs> I know that if if I'm in the bedroom and I ask for a certain song, it will say it'll tell me it'll give me a little upgrade plan. You you know, you, you have done this with your plan. If you want to listen to this one here, you got to pay more. That's I get wild. a little 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 advertisement. Well, I haven't run into that at all. Well, maybe you just don't have very good music taste. Maybe. Well, that's the same thing that happens here in the States, too. Yeah, Fred, you get that limited account, that limited plan on one device? On a single device. And it does not move. It that's stays on that single device. Well, actually, it asks. If you ask for a song that's not on, it is, is not on the unlimited, it... I believe it asks you if you want to change the device. You can you can say I want to designate this device. Maybe okay. I can't All remember. right. 
Well, if if it or even if you had to go into the Amazon app on your phone and say, this is now where I want the plan, I guess that's all fine if you're saving a few bucks. What you wouldn't want to do is activate that new plan on more than what two devices because all of a sudden it's more expensive than yeah unlimited you more. yeah you got to go to the nine dollar plan to do that yeah and the and what they have after that and you're still throughout all that i mean obviously with this limited plan you're talking about you're only doing it on one device but but you still you can't play two different sets of music no. like I would imagine what happens is if you go to your other device, well, gosh, I don't even know what to imagine now because that's so well, – under the $8 I, plan, I, I can tell you under – or under the $9 plan, the eight ninety nine dollars plan, I can tell you how it behaves is you're listening to whatever you want to listen to on one device. You go over to another device. You start listening to music there. The device you were listening to – finishes its song and does not start another song yeah i believe that that's that's how the eight dollar plan works but and but if, I, i'm i'm thinking ahead. we should uh, we should tie this into the old technology i'll dig out an old reel to reel i'll set it up in the living room and record the songs i want take it into that room and listen to it well you know bill you could do that and then you could set one of your speakers on in a intercom mode <laughs> I've, I've never used intercom mode, but I know it exists. And you could have yeah, it broadcast that reel to reel, old school analog, <laughs> <laughs> to all the smart speakers in your house. There you go. So, Scott, we're talking about how, you know, we're known as being cheap. But, anyways, um, Canadians, <laughs> we also have the Netflix account that limits the number of devices that it can be shown on to. So we went from $15 a month with um, Netflix down to nine. I, I applaud your cheapness. <laughs> <laughs> You're finding no. deals that I don't think about. But let me just finish my thought with, if you're in a situation like mine where my kids want to listen to different music in their bedroom than we want to listen to in the living room. You guys can't do that. You can't do that with the unlimited plan. You have to go up to $15 a month to do that. Yes. $15 I think is what it is. Yeah. Okay. And, and wait a minute though. Don't we also have to have other Amazon accounts? Cause that family plan only ties. I Amazon accounts. It says up to six accounts across multiple devices. So how so, how Amazon? I mean, I would imagine each week that that happens differently. Like maybe when they you think about the way Amazon has rolled things out, maybe you have to have a separate account so they can listen to their music and I can listen to my music. But maybe their intention is. You can have six different devices playing six different music. Doesn't matter if they're all on the same account or not. One thing I learned with the unlimited is I can download music, and it's on. It's mine. That's right. Yeah, it's on your away. on your phone, you can you can run the Amazon Music app, and you can store the tracks on your phone and listen to them offline. Wait a minute. Uh, on an iPhone, I could download my Amazon Music? No. no, not on an iPhone. Okay. You can't download it on your phone. You have to download it on an Amazon, Amazon device. You can download it on an Amazon device? I didn't know that. I mean, no, that's I'm cool. Wrong. But you I, can I, download I, I, it I, onto a phone because I was yes, just looking at it this morning. But you can download it to a specific Amazon device, huh? No, I, I stand I'm sorry, Fred. You're you're breaking up. I can't really hear you. I I stand corrected. I am wrong. Oh, okay. Could you say it just a little louder, or just say I'm right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just playing. You're showing, you're showing your age again. But anyways. <laughs> You know, I think the whole, whole discussion last last week started with me asking the question about i accounts, and and if when we buy a new Amazon, I mean, a new i device, should we create a new 
I account or should we use the one we already have? So we went off onto Amazon, but we started from my question about, about. I, what are those called? I what? They're, they're Apple accounts. Sorry, yeah. Apple accounts. Apple ID, Apple service Apple account. ID. Yeah. And I still don't really know, I haven't wrapped my head around, if it's better to have more Apple accounts or if it's better to have one Apple ID. Yeah, that's that's a tough one. You know, I approached it last week like it's better to have fewer, but I think of that just from an an administrative point of view. Like it's easier to keep track of billing methods and assets that you own if they're all under the same account. It gets a little but cumbersome. Can, I'm sorry. You can family up. Uh, you can family the accounts. So, like right now, we have three different Apple IDs. And they're put into the family account, and that's where the transactions and everything come out of the, the family. And you can set those kind of things to be across all of the accounts. Yes. So you have to go back to the family account, change billing information. You have to go back to the organizer's account to change billing information. And that's, that's where right. you... I'm sorry? <laughs> You put your purchase information and everything into the the organizers, the father yeah. account, and then the other ones um, all acts are just linked to that. You only have to put it in once. Right, right. Unless it needs to be changed, but and it can't course, be changed by one of the family accounts. It has to be changed by the organizers. Correct. And but then any the of the thing, family accounts can actually do their own purchasing and have their own purchase method. Uh, no, once you're in the family account, the purchase method is set by, yeah. the, by the family. That's actually like, the experience I had the other day. Somebody had put my customer's account in a family account, and we couldn't add a purchase method to her Apple ID. And, and there was nothing we could do about it. We could not. And I'm sure it was her son-in-law trying to do something for her because he was helping her set it up. But in the end, he's got to be contacted to release her from the family account so she can have her own purchase ID on her Apple ID. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's like when you're bundling stuff, you're bundling it all together and you can't individually change out of that bundle without the parent bundler in my case uh century link doing it like i can't say i want direct tv to not be bundled with century link anymore mm -hmm. and direct tv cannot do that i have to go through century link the parent of that bundle well as as a concept all that sound in the in this case though we're trying to determine what would be better is it better to have a bunch of apple ids that aren't related to each other or you do relate to each other or is it better to try and narrow them all down to one apple id or as few apple ids as possible like they do give you 5 gigabytes of free storage with with each apple id and each That's apple right. id gets the same uh, the same special deal when you sign up, whatever deal happens to be going on. I mean, maybe it's a free month of Apple Music or something of that nature. Whereas you don't get to take advantage of that stuff sometimes with an older account. My question is, can you sit there and your Amazon devices uh, or your Apple devices, can they all be on the different accounts? Well, they, they can. We have different accounts. My Apple um, ID, Apple account for my iPad is different than my Apple account for my iPhone. But you can put those different Apple accounts into a family plan and then you can share things across them. Um, so what we were thinking was if you buy a, a terabyte of um, storage, then it, it's shared across all of them. If you don't put them in the family plan, each of them has five gig of storage. So I'm not sure which is better. <laughs> well, and you can only have five accounts in a family plan, which I suspect is intentional. I, what, whatever the right answer is, Apple knows it. 
because oh. you can only accumulate 25 gigabytes, five accounts at five gigs free shared amongst the accounts. You're still only looking at 25 gigabytes for free. So I'm sure Apple knows what the right answer is. It's priced accordingly. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I can't help but look at it from an administrative point of view. I think that it gets more cumbersome when you have more accounts. I, I think there is a point of view, Cheryl, like like you're probably taking, like what's the best cost analysis of having more or less Apple? I, and I think that's a totally legitimate point of view. But I just think of things like the experience I had with my, my customer who didn't know they were in a family group and now is completely dependent on the organizer in real life to deal with her not being able to add a, a credit card to her Apple ID because yeah. she was included in, in this family plan. Or experiences I've had in the past where people have had one or two accounts, and they, they've had two or three accounts, and they've never bothered to interrelate the accounts as a family account. They've done some purchases over here, some purchases over there, and then you end up with apps installed on your device. The apps you install are literally tied to the Apple ID. So you could have an app installed from a different Apple ID than your main Apple ID. And that's been an issue in the past before. You have to update an app on your, on your phone and it starts asking you for a different Apple ID than the one you're signed into your phone with. Well, back to your, your customer, I think she just should have charged it to the son-in-law. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm trying to remember, did we try doing that? Did we try purchasing anything? I wonder if I could have just purchased anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a that's an interesting idea. Well, it even got even more convoluted because she has a purchase. She has a, we were trying to buy something. Yeah, no, and we couldn't because the the purchase information was invalid or out of date. And she had no in, no interest in using that credit card in the first place. It wasn't hers. She wanted yeah, to use she couldn't, she couldn't probably verify it like with the expiry date or something like that cuz every so well, often you have to verify them. To add insult to injury, we got into her Apple account, her Apple ID and her purchase information her pay information was there but it was not it was not available for the purchasing she was doing so we could see her valid credit card in like if we went to icloud.com and looked into her account id we could see her per, her but when we got into itunes we couldn't do anything because she was part of a family plan and her only method for purchasing content was through this family ID purchase method, which wasn't couldn't be validated. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I I do think from this conversation today that we're having, that it's that it's clear as mud. <laughs> that if if you had thought about these things beforehand, and you if you've thought out your plan, then it's it's probably not a big deal. It sounds like. She and her son-in-law did not think this out before putting her in that circumstance. Whereas, Cheryl, you're talking about like five accounts you have control over. And so you wouldn't be in that circumstance. James needs to unlink his, I mean, unmute his microphone. He's been talking and not. I think he's waiting to talk. There he goes. All right. Now, now I'm ready to go. And uh, Carolyn and I have done something similar. Started off with um one account and then got another account and but they there's there's something the matter with them i, I think one of them is connected to an an, um, an email address that we no longer have we've changed our our um provider our service provider so it, it's it's very it's a huge snarl up of a mess and so we're, we're sitting here thinking well do we just get rid of those two and start with a, a new one, a, a good one, or is there some way of combining the two of them or, or whatever? And if, if anybody knows anything about that, that would really be a, um, something good in my yeah. life. You know, just off the top of my head, I would try getting control of that account with the bad email address. If you can get logged, 
logged into it. If you've got the password, the no, old, we don't. We and don't. do you have devices that are connected to it? Because you may be able to get authorized on one of those devices through a validation code. Mm -hmm. But just by using the device and, and who do we get it validated right from? Uh... Well, you go through the forgot password mm -hmm. and it will ask you for an alternative email or uh, phone number. And it will ask, it'll give you validation codes to one of your devices that's signed in using that original Apple ID. Or it will ask you one of your verification questions or something. Like it, it'll ask you for another way of, of getting in. Yeah, because it keeps sending us um, uh, messages to a, an account we don't have anymore. Yeah, you have to choose a different way. But they're I, Apple. I don't know. Maybe yeah, it's it, that it, box. it may even be worth getting Apple on the phone for. Because they deal with that stuff and they realize, I mean, that's actually some of the best customer help they have is helping you deal with stuff like that. I just yeah. had a really successful experience with a guy whose cell phone was having problems. And so we decided to back it up and restore it. What I didn't know at the time was he changed his phone number. And so when the restore came back in, we had to validate the uh, Apple ID and it wouldn't let us validate it because it was sending the validation code to his old phone number. And the old phone number, he, he, what he had done is he had he'd switched from US service to Mexican service in the time period he was having problems with his phone. And he canceled his US phone number, which was his two-factor authentication for his phone. So when it asks for a two-factor authentication, there's nowhere to send the number to. And it did take us two weeks to sort out and it took having another cell phone number, but they finally reviewed his, and we didn't talk to a real person. We, we submitted it as a case under their automatic system. We gave them a separate phone number. You may not have to do that, James, because it's not the same situation. Mm -hmm. And they, they made phone calls and text messages to my cell phone to, to verify that that number was good. And then I gave him codes from my phone they already have his new phone number because that's what's getting flashed back to them with every transaction from the device and so i they know he has the new phone i have the alternate phone they send the code to the alternate phone he puts it into the new phone and finally finally he's got control over his apple id again but i can imagine the relief <laughs> a lot of patience is required when dealing with those problems because it's all about validation. They oh, oh, I forgot to mention they had us validate a credit card because he had a credit card on on file. They asked us for so many digits in his credit card number. This is all their validation process. And they they took that information and and the case and then came back to us 24 hours later. Yeah, actually, but it took us two weeks to sort out before it was finally. And the no, phone, no. the device played an issue in it, too, because there was two different places it was asking for validation. And in one of them, it would never work correctly. In fact, we, we learned that if one popped up, we had to cancel that so we could get to the other one. And the other one was what was making the changes and submitting the right information. And that was an iPhone iPhone, iOS 14 thing. Well, it's a, it's a conundrum for us right now. Well, it can be done, but it's it's with with a lot of patience. <laughs> a lot of patience. Well, we but, got the time. <laughs> okay, Scott. Yes, Bill. I just got an email this morning from LastPass. And they said they're making some changes to their free account. That always sends a shiver down your back. And the change they're going to make is in March, I believe it is, uh, March 16th or something, they're going to allow free a free account either on a laptop, all your laptops, any laptop that you have, or a free account on any uh, mobile device. 
but not both. If you want, you want last uh, last pass to work on your laptop and your cell phone. You have to subscribe. Wow, I haven't even seen that. Uh, I just got it this morning. Maybe it was. I checked some email here in uh, while well, you guys were talking. No, we'll uh, have to it, we'll have to go. circle back to that on a on a future meeting because that's that's going to screw me up. Well, it says we uh, we're making some changes uh, to LastPass free group. Love being part of security. Yada yada yada. Beginning March sixteenth, we will be introducing some changes. Uh, and what's changing? Uh, LastPass free will include access on one device type of your choice. First device you log into with on or after March sixteenth will be your active device type. So you can have laptops, desktops, or you can have mobiles. And tablets, not both. So, they, are they? Do they have the same pricing? I I don't have an email oh, from. I'm checking uh, my email to see if I have a, but I don't have an email from them right. Now. Uh, yeah, the price. Well, the pricing list here, I think. Uh, oh, maybe not. Oh, they're going to give you twenty five percent off as a free user. You can upgrade two twenty five per month, billed annually, twenty seven dollars a year. Go premium today. So, so they're trying to be cheap enough that it's an easy decision. Yeah, they're gonna they're 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 gonna slide in there with a with a reasonable price and and make you bite. You because, know what? This is gonna force me to do the research into the Chrome authentication because they have just done something that's very similar. In fact, all the browsers have their own password management system now, whereas when LastPass started, they didn't, and both Microsoft and Google have these authenticators that you can download as apps into your phones. And I haven't paid a lot of attention to them, as they, but they've become much more robust. And it may be that one of those browsers could end up being the replacement, the free replacement for LastPass. I'll have to yeah, really do it. They've got, me, able... they've got me deep enough into LastPass now that I depend on it all the time. Yeah, me too. I'm the same way. That sounds pretty cheap, actually, just to keep doing what I'm doing. That's what they're betting on. Yeah, no, it's working. <laughs> when you <laughs> when when you have this much computer power, I, uh, apparently it's pretty easy to figure out the 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 psychiatry of humans and how they make decisions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you think about how how the hell do you get all your you know like you get I've got probably a uh, hundred different passwords in LastPass and credit cards and stuff now. Well, well keep uh, in mind it's convenience that you're you're trading off because in LastPass you can export all of that to a spreadsheet. Uh, yeah, but then you got to key it back into the other ones. Right, yeah. So gonna, you you got to migrate it. That's but what really, I'm saying. I mean, I, before LastPass, there was a lot of us just using little black books and that's essentially what that prep. Or scraps of paper. <laughs> yeah. And I've, one password. I've, one password rules them all. I've been trying to change a saved password in Firefox and haven't been able to change it. It's got an old password and it does not update. So I've got to research that. If you go into the password section, you should be able yes. to search it by by website. And I can do that, but I can't, have not yet found a way to change the saved one. I can see it, but it won't I think figure out how to edit that. Huh? Because it doesn't say, oh, we see that you're using a different password. Do you want us to update your password? It does not do that. So you should be able to do that manually. I'm just trying to bring up my Firefox installation. The Some of this stuff you do so often. I can't even think of how to do it. Maybe because I was trying to do it on an iPad rather than my laptop. Mm, I would still think you'd be able to do it. On the iPad, it's not a Firefox password, is it? Yes, it is. I use Firefox on my iPad. And you're synchronizing. You're using the yeah. Firefox sync. Um. Well, I don't know. I have a, an app downloaded for Firefox on my iPad. 
Right, right. Okay, I mean, so I that wouldn't... Think... But unless you're using Firefox Sync, it wouldn't be syncing passwords. So the password stored on your iPad would be only on your iPad, unless you stored it on a desktop as well. But there would be two different storages. It wouldn't be the same storage. It's not like the <laughs> iCloud keychain, unless yeah. you're signing into the Firefox Syncer. If you're if you're signing into a Firefox account, then all your passwords would flow between your desktop and your mobile device. Well, and that that's true because my bookmarks change on my iPad and my laptop, so I am syncing, but I have not found out how to change the password. When I click on that password, it says invalid password. You're using an old password to log into Facebook. <coughs> Okay, I'm looking at Firefox right now. I'm not going to show it on my screen because it's all my passwords. And can I edit this right here? Yeah, I can edit the password right here from the password screen. So okay, if you, so if you yeah, go into okay. settings under autofill, yeah. there's passwords. Okay. And then that brings up a list of all your saved passwords. Right. And next to each website password field, there's the three dots that more. In fact, I'm going to show you this on my screen. Hold on. Okay. Yeah. So here we are in settings. This is what settings look like when you go up to the three dots and you choose settings in Firefox. Damn it. This isn't Firefox. This is Firefox. Try this again. <laughs> Logins and passwords. I just gave you Chrome instructions by accident. Uh, this is what fire. Oh, Lockwise. I've started using Lockwise. I forgot about that. Hold on. Privacy mode. <laughs> just because I don't want it out on YouTube. Okay. All right. Cool. There is there is an edit button. So again, this is Firefox. Go up to the hamburger menu in the upper right hand corner, and in that pull down list, there is logins and passwords. Okay. That brings up this. This is new. It it happened maybe three months ago. This thing called Firefox Lockwise. Oh. This is a password manager that can be downloaded by itself. It can be stored on your phone. It can be the, the version for your desktop computers is the version that comes in Firefox, but it's a standalone that you can download from your phone for your okay. password manager. And these are the accounts that have stored passwords Okay. in the column to the left. And each one of them I can edit in this field to the right uh -huh. and there's an edit button right here and so there i okay. can change the password and hit save oh look at that thank you yeah i would use the search at the top and search for that website because you might find you have four or five passwords saved oh, for have. that for that website and maybe maybe you have been successful to save one of them but the circumstances you're going in it's grabbing a different one Right. Okay. Thank you. LastPass yeah. for your Firefox passwords. I do not use LastPass. No. You use. I have, a, I have my little black book that I write them down in. <laughs> I'm still old school. Well, and then you probably, whether whether intentionally or not, you're probably sharing your Apple passwords, like Safari to Safari. Uh, yes. Email to email because that all gets stored in your Apple ID and your keychain. Exactly. And the keychain gets passed around your devices. Exactly. Unfortunately, that wouldn't be Firefox passwords, though. No. Well, that was a long bit of follow up from last week's meeting and some great impromptu talks. Uh, I wanted to bring up, I've still got topics, but I also want to take a chance for some recommendations. 
because we seem to be enjoying that so much that I'm hoping people have brought things that they have read, watched, listened to, used. Recommendations are for everything, websites and applications, devices, anything that you think we should know about that you're finding helpful. I see a hand up, so I'll let Judy go first. <laughs> I just want to thank uh, News of the World is on down here on Netflix, and it was pretty good. News of the World, the Tom Hanks movie? Yes. We watched that the other day. I am coming pretty- through on somebody's speakers, I think. Right. It's Kate. Kathleen. Kathleen. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So you would, a recommendation. <laughs> you would re-recommend the, the news of, a, of the world, the Tom Hanks movie? Yeah, I would. We, to be honest with you, we, we watched it the other day. I think you, you thoroughly enjoyed it, and I fell asleep twice in it. Well, yeah, it was a little slow, but just the idea that that went on after the Civil War, I thought was really interesting, that people actually went around reading the news. That that was a. I I agree. I found that part very interesting. That he had it was like his show. He went around and did his show. Exactly. I enjoyed it. I guess I'm different. Oh, I liked it. <laughs> yeah, I think everybody liked it, Chester. You're not different. I'm just tired at night. <laughs> I do have a question though. I finally finished the fifth year of Boardwalk. Uh, Boardwalk um, uh, Empire, <clears throat> and looking for something else. Well, let's see here. We've got some other hands up for recommendations. Maybe keep that in mind as people are recommending. Kathleen, you had your hand up for a moment. Did you have something to contribute? Well, not a television program, but I'm finding that the TED Talks on technology are really fascinating. So every morning when I take my walk, I listen to a couple of them. Highly recommend it. That's great. As podcasts, you're listening to them as podcasts, I'm imagining. Right. Uh huh. And these are the TED Talks. And so you can specifically then go to technology. Have you got a specific one you've listened to recently that's got you turned on? Um, well, I, I did have, oh boy, now I'm going to have to look at my phone. No, no worry. No, I, I don't I work can't. too hard. No. <laughs> yeah, no, I can't find it, but, but um, you know, I'm enjoying it. I'll, I'll find some for you and give you some names. We always love the TED Talks. Can uh, Cheryl, I see you've got a hand up too. Did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I watched um, Head Full of Honey. What? Which is that a sounds new- like a Winnie the Pooh movie. <laughs> That's my <laughs> That's alter ego, coming, but anyways. Full of honey. <laughs> um, no, a head full of honey is is Alzheimer's, and it's Nick Nolte. Like I've never seen Nick Nolte, and, and I quite enjoyed it. Uh, it's his relationship with his granddaughter, who uh, takes him goes into his world as opposed to uh, um, trying to force somebody with Alzheimer's to live in our world. Um, it, it was a very very interesting movie. Um, I learned some things about Alzheimer's. I, I found it very entertaining and interesting funny it, it was good so is it, is um, it new one, i, I i've hmm. never heard of it is it new well it, it came up on my netflix um number top 10 in canada right okay. now so uh, it's a uh, nick nolte and it's yeah head full of honey head full of honey okay and um jester you said boardwalk empire and you're looking for something similar have you ever watched uh suits what is it? Suits. Um, no, I have not. It's English, okay. right? No, it's American, but Meghan Merkel is in it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so that's maybe where you got confused about the British, because after she did it, she ended up being the princess. But anyways, no, it's an older one, a series, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's lawyers and, well, this guy isn't a lawyer, but he's got a... Um, what do you call it when you can remember everything you read? Is that S U I T S or S U T E S? S U I T, like as in. Where 
I looked for that. Oh my yeah, God. I really enjoyed that one. And then um, this week I watched a series. It's There's three parts to the series. It's called um, The Sinners. And it, it's the, the common thread of, amongst the three um, three series with about eight or ten episodes in each one is a sinner. So there's a crime that's committed and then the detective goes into it. A lot of psychological thriller kind of things. It's quite scary and upsetting, but it, it is a, an interesting um, show. The, the, the Sinner, it's got Bill Pullman in it. Is that, is that, that's what you're talking about? I don't know the actor, but The Sinner. Is the the sure. sinner, yeah. Oh Jessica Beale was in the first season. Actually, her and her husband, I think, produced that. Ooh. It was originally produced for one season and got so much. So, so they they had to come up with two more seasons of stories for it. It's really good. I've watched all of it. Have you? I kind of thought of it was like three different movies with the same character in it. You know, and they broke it down and. And you have to watch the whole series, it seems, <laughs> because you get stuck into it, which leads to two o'clock in the morning nights sometimes. But anyways, uh, The Sinners, it, it uh, I, I would recommend it. It's it, not easy to watch some of the things that these people have lived with. It's it's It centers around, I don't think it centers as much around the detective in the first season. In the first season, it really felt like it was that story that original story, that original center. But then this, the following two seasons really did focus around the detective and his story as much as what he was trying to solve. Yeah. And, yeah. In the first season where we get introduced to the detective, but I didn't really feel like he was the major character in the first season. I felt he was like, he was like a tool. He, he was the instrument we were using to learn the story. But then in the following two seasons, we really learned his story and how these kinds of investigations affect him. Yeah, and or how his past he can relate to and, and start looking into these people and why they're doing the things they're doing. I, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a great, great. And you find it on Netflix, The, the Center. I had mentioned before that I had started watching Your Honor and oh, I dropped it, I dropped it uh, after three hours, but now I've started back to finish the series. <clears throat> I, I enjoy it because it's in New Orleans, and I lived there for four years, so I can relate to a lot of the filming. Oh, the, the locations and the culture? Yes. I, uh, okay. Okay. Oh, go ahead, Bill. What do you got? I... I... I don't have a movie recommendation, but I ran across a website the other day. It's called uh, Movie of the Day, and it's uh, it, it's a person's take on, on individual movies. And the I find the writer very humorous. I read their uh, her re, uh, review of Snakes on a Plane, and it's worth going to the site just to read that. You know. Well, I've never right seen now. the movie. I don't even know if I will go see the movie, but it, 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 uh, that's the only one I've read, and I'm going to go back and read some more of them, but it, it's hilarious. And you it, put the link in the chat. I oh, you've got the link there? In, I'm just trying to Google in the it. Chat. In, I'm unsuccessfully mm -hmm. trying to. Oh, it's an Australian site. It's yes, a, it's, it's, it's Australian. Retelling of the movie. Yeah. Oh, cool. And, and it's you know, like I say, it just even just go read Snakes on the Plane. It's it's worth it. To me, it was. I might even go back and watch the uh, the, the the movie now. She she put a uh, an Easter egg in there. Said that the prop, you know, somebody in the prop department had a real sense of humor because these snakes come out of the lockers, out of you know the standard horror movie surprise latch on to you. It said. One of the snakes had a nose ring. Ah. So I got to go watch just to see the nose ring, I suppose. And she gave the, the exact frame uh, spot or the spot where it, it Where to up. find it. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Yeah. Now I got to go look at it. I haven't seen that movie <laughs> since it was released. 
Well, I have never seen it. I, I figured this has got to be the stupidest thing for a movie. <laughs> Yeah, but, but there sounds... are those of us that find real value in stupid movies. <laughs> <laughs> you have way too much time on that. <laughs> I'd like to ask Chester. Um, you said you watched Boardwalk Empire. How was what it was that? How was it? It's uh, five years, uh, fifty hours, and I think fifty-six hours, and it is in the period of. Uh, uh, when no no liquor uh, during the gangster period of the 1920s. The prohibition. It's prohibition. It's very well done, and the main character is a boss in in um, in uh, Atlantic City, and uh, it it goes on and on and on and on. So, but I I found it entertaining. There's some really good actors that are now pretty prominent that come out of that uh, series. That's I can't think of names of them right at the moment, but... Um, well, one of the interesting, interesting things was the very last trailer, and it, it went into the production and the actors and and uh, their uh, how, how it was all produced. I thought that trailer was very interesting. Hey, uh, James, you looked like you had something co to contribute earlier. We didn't mean to skip past you. I think the same brain fog came to me that uh, I caught from you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I come with one movie today uh, that I feel like I need to share. Have you heard of a movie called King Rat? 1965 yes. Black and White with George Siegel. It's a... It's, uh, the, James sorry. Patterson, is it? Who, who wrote it? James Clavell. I don't know who wrote it. I only know as... what I wrote down to tell you. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's based on the story. Go ahead. Sid would know better than me. No, I read the book and watched the movie. It's a great movie. I really it's, uh, go ahead. It's based on the James Cavell book. This is the one Bill was just mentioning. Yes. I'm just going to sit over here and shut up. Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> well, it's a prisoner of war movie, World War II, and the uh, the premise is there's a guy running the camp, one of the prisoners that's just he's the guy. He's the guy you go to for cigarettes. He's the guy that gets things done. What's the name of it again? King Rat. Is that and a rat or rat? Rat, like rata, like, uh, like sewer rat. Oh, okay. And I found it thoroughly enjoyable. I didn't, you, you know, I've told you before, I like having stuff in the background while I work. And this made me mad because it kept distracting me. It was too good. I need, I'm, I'm shooting for that midi mediocre quality. And, and this kept distracting me from getting my work done. So that's, that's a good testimony to, to being an interesting movie. It was uh, interesting to watch the interactions and... I, I know very little about World War II prison camps as far as Japanese holding Americans and Englishmen, but it seemed a lot more civilized than I expected to be, though they were starving, and but they had their own uh, rank. They had their, their own you know, chain of, of command that was going on that, that had to interact with the Japanese authorities as well. They had to sounds police like, themselves. I'm sorry, who? Sounds like the bridge over the River Kwai. Oh, that's one I haven't watched, but I've heard the title a number of times. Yeah, that's a great movie, World War II uh, prison camp. Japanese prison camp. The famous movie. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely famous. heard the title. I've never taken the opportunity to watch it. A very famous theme song, too. Yeah, the sound, soundtrack. Soundtrack, yeah. Excellent movie. It'd be worth your time. Well, I'm going to add it to my watch list. 
Hey, Scott, there's even a joke in Spaceballs based on that movie. Which one? The King Rat? <laughs> yeah, no, um, The Bridge King Over the River Why? The, the theme the Jawas sing in Spaceballs. Oh, yeah? Yeah, that's that's the the song from Bridge Over the River Kwai. All right. Well, now I've got to watch both. I don't know if you guys have ever watched Spaceballs, but to me, it's one of those movies. Every time I watch it, it's better. <laughs> Mel Brooks was a genius. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is an old one, and maybe you guys have talked about this before. I don't know. It's an Australian series. It's it's not that old. I mean, it's a decade probably old. Called Rake R A K E. The U S made one, um, but it didn't turn that series. But it didn't turn out as nearly as well as the Australian one. So that's I think a lot. It's a fun. It's a comedy. It's it's about lawyering, and the main character is. Of course, one of these lawyers that does everything his own way, oftentimes wrong. So there's a lot of uh, fun watching him figure out how to get out of the scrapes that he's in. There's some really, um, I don't know the actresses' names, but some a couple of really good actresses, female actresses in it. You may recognize them. I do recognize a couple from other Australian series, but... Um, Anyway, I, that's my offer for the, this meeting. Well, thank you, Mom. Rake, I, I seem to remember I try, I, I started watching that, never got back to it. The Long Australian one? Yeah, the when Australian it was new. Was, I tried yeah. the American one, and the American one was pretty good. It was enough for me to try the Australian one, but I think I dropped both series. Huh. That was years ago, well, though. It might not be for everyone, but we really enjoyed it. Might have also been the time period. You know, some of this stuff is more entertaining given given where you are, where you are in your life and, and where we are culturally. How desperate you are for entertainment. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> How long you've been under quarantine. Yeah, we've been watching some pretty crummy stuff here lately, just out of desperation. <laughs> when you find yourself sitting in the living room watching dust bunnies floating around in a breeze going, hey, that one almost caught it. <laughs> when you have your ankle in a cast and they say you can't walk, that's that's my my day now. Oh, mom, Monday, how many more I weeks do you have? Cast. I think Monday's a walking cast. Finally. I have a recommendation if you guys can hear me. Hi, Irving. We can hear you. What's your recommendation? Uh, okay. I don't know. It's for everyone. It's one of the top considered 100 films of all time. Star Wars? Uh, I love, I love uh, food movies, and this is one of the best. And it's called, and I'm, some of you must have seen it, it's called Babette's Feast. And the way it's spelled is B-A-B-E-T-T-E-S. Feast, like in meal, and uh, <clears throat> it's a foreign film with titles, I assume. I think it's Belgium movies. or Netherlands, isn't it? I'm not sure What's if it's it? Netherlands or on the moors of Scotland. Uh, it's a uh, it takes place in a little four village, a four house village. It's a great, great film, and it is about a, a, a meal, believe it or not. But it's, it's, like I say, rated one of my favorite films. I watch it every five years or so. Uh, it's an older film. And uh, I recommend it very, very highly. What's the subject? A meal. Do you like to eat? <laughs> oh. oh, OK. Feast, F-E-A-S-T. -E but it is uh, a lot more to it. What they're doing is they're, they're having a celebration of their father's two women that run this little community. Their father invented a religion on his 100th anniversary of the religion. And um, it's uh, really a great, great film. And it does have to do with a meal. <laughs> Beautiful but pious sisters Martine and Philippa grow 
to spinsterhood under the wrath, full eye of their strict pastor father, on the forbidding and desolate coast of Jutland, until one day Philip's, Philippa's former suitor sends a part. Where's the food part of this? <laughs> oh, that's what it's about. It's there. Oh, here it is. Okay. A uh, refugee named Babette to serve as the family cook. Babette's lavish celebratory banquet tempts the family's dwindling congregation who abhor such fleshly pleasures as the fine foods and wines. Interesting. <laughs> well, as I said, this is really it sounds like a provocative a food movie. <laughs> Well, it's one of the top movies of all time. So, uh, and I find that great foreign films, uh, if they come into the uh, into our view, they're usually outstanding. I uh, agree with that. I think this is it, Irving. I think I'm looking at it. I, if you can see my screen. Yeah, you you got the movie. That, yeah, that's correct. I only have one other comment before I have to leave, and that is last night I got shot number two. Ah, congratulations. Way to go. Congratulations. How are you feeling, Chester? I feel fine. Is it, As a matter of fact, is it I, the second I, day passed? I accused the lady of not shoot, giving me the shot because I couldn't feel it. <laughs> it wow. It happened so fast, I never felt it. Did hey. you say that was your second one? Yes. And you're feeling fine today? Feeling fine. Oh, man. Now, I felt terrible the next day. Terry waited a day, and then he fell apart. So don't plan anything tomorrow and see what happens. Right. <laughs> Take it well, easy. What Chester, you? what did you have? Pfizer? I had the Pfizer. I had the Pfizer. Sandy, what did you have? Um, the... The, the M, the Moderna. 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 Thank you. I've got Scott's problem. <laughs> I what I meant to say. It runs Moderna. in the family. <laughs> I've got my second one tomorrow and then heading to Mexico. The same day? No, 10 days later. Oh, hey. good. You're giving yourself a couple days just in yeah. case. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Chester, don't, don't take off so quickly. I've got one more topic that I think everybody will find interesting. And I also want to give Richard credit for King Rat. I had never heard of that movie until he was talking to me about it. And he piqued my interest enough that I had to go download it. But I have a topic I think all of us will find interesting. It's called Radio.Garden. Has anybody heard of this web address yet? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're aware of this. I just became aware of this last week. This is some pretty cool stuff. This is a web. It's this an is awesome a site. Yeah, this is a website. That's the address, radio dot garden. And I'm waiting for it to come up right now. And who knows how long it takes to load when you've got kids doing school in the other room and you're streaming a. Scott, here we go. It's radio 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 garden dot com, isn't it? Oh, the web address I'm using is radio dot garden. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm not sure which, which one I have. Well, I wonder. It's probably the same thing. It's probably just because domains oh, have I'm gotten. I'm sure it is. Yeah, domains have gotten so sophisticated now. You can have a dot .garden domain, but I'll try radiogarden.com. No, that radiogarden.com doesn't bring up anything. It's for sale. Oh, okay. I I, I just saw it on, on the internet and, and tagged it. I didn't look at the address. Well, this is me bringing it up. If you're looking to my screen, I probably shouldn't let myself get distracted because it was right in front of us. But I'm there, sorry. there is a Google Earth style interface for finding uh, geolocated radio stations. The link I have is taking me to the Wymus area. But if I scroll out of this, I'm looking at the planet. I hope you guys can see this. Yep. And all the green dots are radio stations where they're geographically located. Commercial? And why no, would we, uh, internet. 2848 is the number. 
Go ahead and dial in. Because it's got awesome quality radio you know about available at your fingertips all over the, the world. Is a number I just went to Alaska. This if is you're a, a Native American entrepreneur. A list of stations available in Anchorage. Meant for her and that she's going to be able to. Oh, you guys uh, can't hear any of this right now because I am not. Bless her from here forward. And as Tom not prayed for uh, Don, we pray the same things out. for Serena. Well, she is me. seeking a just Let stable do this. employment. So, uh, well, I've used the station uh, and what I used the waves of depression was to find and real and old and also to uh, move forward classic with country, where we know that it's been a hard time, a difficult time more so than Oklahoma we've ever experienced. And get that kind of music. We just pray for the joy of the. It's a, a great, great uh, a resource. Yeah, this Any is... Any type of music that comes, you know, from... It originates from... Well, just like... Wait, Can you what select... Irving was just office. saying, just I went into Chicago. Like, like NPR? Popular in Chicago. Anyway. Old, wild... How long have gone? Wild no, West no. Old Time Radio. No, but I know why. Uh, why? There's some of the best fishing in the world, not far from Pueblo. What I like about it is how easy it is to use. You just go, you click, all of a sudden you're getting entertainment. Let me switch my mic back so you guys don't have to listen to yourselves echo. Okay. So this is one of my uh, recommendations for today is radio.garden. And it brings up, it's like a Google Earth. You can spin the Earth looking for radio stations all over the world. And center in onto an area and see what radio stations are available and pick a channel and be able to listen to it directly. Incredibly fast. Incredibly fast. It's a great visual uh, indicator. It's a great visual interface. And it's got great audio quality coming out of all these stations. Is it FM and AM? Well, in the stations that I've been uh, searching through, it seems like a lot of them are, are FM. I'm, I guess I haven't paid attention if there's AM stations. Let me get down. You know, there's got to be AM stations because there's a big list of them for Wymus, and there's a lot of AM stations. I'm still on this thing in case you're wondering what I'm doing. I'm going back over to Mexico. Wymus would be a great place to look for FM station. You guys can't hear any of this. There we go. Yeah, you feel like you're in Mexico now? Anyway. It looks like FM. I don't... I would think that this would where, be where we would find AM stations would be in Wymus, and I don't see any listed here, so maybe it is just a FM station. But it's a very cool way to accumulate all these radio stations across the world and have access to them. Go look in the Midwest. Yeah, are you looking for something in particular? Kansas. No, for AM station. How about yeah, Denver? Uh, oh, there's an AM station right there. She had done so well with single family properties. I was fully oh, yeah, confident it's a talk radio to station. handle a 50, 55 unit uh, complex. Here's another one, KOA AM. So yeah, it looks like it includes any stations that have been listed as being available online. Oh, that's the first one. I, I think it would be a... Sorry, go ahead. It would be a great thing. Uh, I, like, I like this idea because I'm going to... Uh-oh, I'm, I'm echoing. Oh, it... I thought I turned that off. Let me double check. 
Are you coming through somebody's speakers or are you coming through our system here? Right through the, through the system. Oh, no, I'm stuck. I'm stuck now. Oh, no, no, I'm echoing No, still. no, I, I thought I switched it off, but I didn't. Here, there we go. That should do it. Anyway, I think I think this is a great idea because so so many times when you listen to radio stations, uh, you, you get a, a very different perspective from another country, and so being able to listen to uh, English speaking Australians, New Zealanders, South Africans, uh, Brits, Americans, Canadians, you know, I think you get a better perspective on on the reality because uh, people are talking to political audiences so many times in one country that you get to hear a variety. Well, even on on a sur superficial level, I, that's that's a lot deeper than I was thinking. But so often, I just want to put some entertainment in the background. I don't want to think about it. I just want to hit a button and have something play. Whereas yeah. you, start I often listen to to uh, talk talk shows from Australia to put me to sleep in the middle of the night if I wake up. Oh, that's great. <laughs> well, I just like the abundance, being able to spin the globe click on a green dot and have something play almost instantly in the background. That's pretty awesome. There, I found one in Greenland. Really? Yeah. <laughs> one. That's all I saw. But it, and what? it's in, it's in uh, Inuit language of some kind. Oh. Indigenous. I wonder if the white dots are AM and the green dots are FM. I, I don't have any white dots. Okay. Oh, well, and then, uh, oh they Green turn white, white when I hover over them. Oh, maybe that's it. No. The one in Greenland is white all, all the time. Tant, il faut continuer de respecter les mesures sanitaires de base, comme maintenir la distanciation physique de 2 mètres, porter le masque et se laver les mains régulièrement. Les déplacements et les voyages sont à éviter. En cas de symptômes, il est important de se faire tester rapidement et de respecter les consignes d'isolement. Découvrez toutes les mesures en place à québec.ca baroblique coronavirus. On continue de bien se protéger. Un message du gouvernement du Québec. Hey, I didn't know I spoke French. I knew at least two words there. Les Jeux des 50 ans et plus GIM lancent une nouvelle programmation d'activités à réaliser gratuitement du confort de votre maison. À compter du 8 mars, pour 14 semaines, des activités de yoga, musculation, stretching. Well. OK, and we're going to ride this whole segment out with on, on that noise. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so that goes on the recommendation list from me. <laughs> excellent, 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 excellent recommendation. recommendation. Yeah, very good idea. Well, we have gone over like we typically do, and I've exhausted my list of topics. If there's anything you guys want to contribute to today's meeting, this is the moment. If if not, I'm going to close us out, say goodbye, and remind you how much I enjoy talking to you every week. I'm so glad. I will keep doing this as long as you guys are interested. And always feel free to send me any topics you think would be great for the group. I will plan on bringing them up on the next meeting we have. Until then, you guys have a great week. I'm going to say tech on until next Tuesday. Happy Stay Marty. Bye -bye. Happy Bye, Thanksgiving. everyone. Thank you, Scott. You're welcome, Irving. I look forward to seeing you in Mexico soon. Oh, excellent. Yay. You're coming down. That'll be great. Yeah. yeah. Yay. Congratulations, Katie. All right. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Bye -bye. Adios, all. Um, Scott? Yes. Question from your dad. Oh, OK. We can take it after you close. Sure. Let, let's uh, shut off here and we'll uh, get into another meet. I'll send you a different code. Okay. Okay. Adios. Bye, everyone. See you guys. Okay. So that was our meeting for, wow, February 16th, 2021. If you are.